okay hello hi welcome back to my channel for those who are new here i am let's talk about it where i discuss my favorite tv shows and movies and just basically yeah, talk my shit this week's video is going to be a recap on the tv show awkward because i loved 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 this show growing up and i'm generally curious as why like no one really talks about it or celebrates it and we talk about gossip girl all the time we talk about vampire diaries but we never talk about awkward and i don't know why i think it should be a staple in pop culture conversations on teen tv shows looking at it now yeah it was a bit problematic at times but in general mtv was in their bag here like it was funny it was quirky it was just cute very much early 2000s and yeah i was here for it it didn't take itself too seriously and they let you know that like straight away from episode one did the quality decline as the seasons went on yeah sure but that's to be expected from the genre was the ending kind of shit oh absolutely but those first three seasons wah chef kisses just edgy and provocative the writing was witty and clever i loved the cast everyone clocked in and did what they needed to do and i was eating good tomorrow miss mark sadie's 10 across the boards i fear they did what they needed to do want to bully miss hamilton here do it online you grow some balls. Just to go over the premise real quick and give you guys um, a brief overview, especially those who don't know anything about the show. Awkward is an MTV American teen comedy series that centers around Jenna Hamilton, a California teenager who struggles to establish her identity, which is complicated when she has a freak accident that is misinterpreted as a suicide attempt. It premiered in July 2011 and was generally well received audiences and critics praising it for its realism and writing as well as its central character so yeah it was critically acclaimed so it should i don't know it should be remembered more it shouldn't have been a show that just came and gone but i feel like it is which is weird but yeah it went on for about five seasons which i think was a one too many but all in all yeah a good time and i rewatch it several times over the years i'll be selfish apparently that's something i need to work on so let's talk about the characters. First, of course, we have the main character, Jenna Hamilton. She's an aspiring writer, so she's obviously self-centered and sometimes narcissistic. It is about me, it is all about me. Sit your ass down. She's all right at times, but as the main character, it's kind of her job to be annoying, so we kind of know what to expect. She's initially introduced as a socially awkward and invisible high school student. After a mysterious um, accident is misconstrued as a suicide attempt, Jenna becomes the focus of attention in her school. Jenna is intelligent, introspective, and sarcastic. She struggles with self-esteem issues and the pressure to fit in. Typical high school teenager stuff. Throughout the series though, she undergoes significant personal growth and navigates the complexities of relationships. She grows more into herself and we watch her become a more well-rounded person all in all. Then we have Tamara Coupling, which I don't think I ever heard her last name on the show, but she is Jenna's best friend. She probably gave us some of the most funniest, the best lines on the show. Don't tweak, you only have to wear it for like a week. She's annoying, but in a verbal way for the most part, especially for a character on a TV show. In reality though, I think she would be a bit too much for me. She's quirky and energetic and a very supportive and honest friend. Unlike Jenna, who just isn't built to be popular, I would say Tamara is. She's fun and confident and outgoing. She can get along with most people, but sometimes she can get quite bossy. She often provides comic relief in the series, and despite her sometimes over-the-top antics, she cares deeply for her friends and can face her own challenges, stand her ground and stand on her own two feet. What I don't know is, are you a cool Asian or a school Asian? Then we have Ming, who is Jenna's other best friend. She is written to be like the westernized POC, coming from a strict Asian-American family. She initially struggles with the expectations placed on her. At first, she has very little interaction with other Asians in school and is academically average at best. I like her whole storyline when she dates Fred Wu, the ex-boyfriend of her nemesis, Tebeka, but I hate that she randomly leaves um, just after season three. I think she was fun and she was a great addition to the show, but apparently she left because the actress just wanted to move on, which is fair enough. She's nerdy, witty, and also a bit of a comic relief in the series. She's known for her unique fashion sense and sarcastic humor. Despite her initial social status as an outsider, Ming becomes more confident and assertive as the series progresses, especially when she becomes the head of the Asian mafia. I'll go into that a bit more. Um, and she grows more into her own cultural identity. I would say she was one of my favorite characters on the show. What if she doesn't text you back? She's gonna have all the power. This isn't junior high. Then we have the one and only Matty McKibben. 
He's Jenna's main love interest throughout the show. I didn't realise how much of a prick he was to Jenna at first, being blinded by their love story, but with all the eyes, yeah, this nigga sucked. He's a typical popular hot jock that looks way too old to be the age of the character he's playing. How old are you? 15. Shit, nigga, you at least 30. Over the course of the series, he kind of sheds this stereotypical jock um, image and we see a more deeper, sensitive side to him. He struggles when he's out of his comfort zone, as he normally doesn't have to try very hard to be liked or fit in. He too has his own insecurities and struggles with the expectations placed on him due to his popularity. Of the series, he has a complicated relationship with Jenna and their off-again, on-again dynamic is... I would say the central focus or the central love story focus of the show. I think it was really hot when I first watched the show, but yeah, I can just see just a basic, typical hot white boy. I also still questioned his love or his genuine love for Jenna, but during this rewatch, yeah, he loved that girl. He loved her down, and there's no doubt in my mind now. And I'm sorry for doubting you, Matty. Like, he puts up with so much of a bullshit, so much it's crazy. Even love the when she didn't deserve it. Like, you know what? He was a good one. He was a good one. Ladies, prepare yourselves. I like to rip it up and it ain't pretty. Then there's Jake Rosati. Rosati the hottie. Or something like that. He's Matty's best friend and a brief love interest for Jenna, who later becomes one of his closest friends. Jake is popular like Matty, but for different reasons. He's the class president. He's involved in various school activities and sports. He's known for his smarts and tends to be a well-liked character for his caring nature. Later, Jake and Tamara date briefly, but um, they also break up due to, you know, growing pains, I would say. Throughout the show, Jake goes through a, a series of identity crisis, rejecting his goody two-shoes image to become a cooler singer, then, la then later, as a townie, opting to take a gap year from college and stay in Palo Hills, which is, I think, the city or the town where they all live. His most frequent love interest though is um, Lissa. All in all, he's a sweet guy trying to find himself who just sees the best in everyone. You suck at being anorexic. Time to embrace bulimia. Then we have a Miss Sadie, you're welcome, Saxton. She's one of the most popular girls in school, though mostly because everyone's kind of afraid of her and she's head cheerleader. Sadie is known for her wits and insults, which are usually followed by the iconic. You're welcome. She has an immense dislike for Jenna, but this is because she has a crush on Matty and could tell that there was something going on between him and Jenna. Later in the series, her dad goes to jail because of a Ponzi scheme and her family loses all their money. Her mother abandons her and she's kind of adopted by um, Jenna's mother and um, best friend. Initially portrayed as a stereotypical antagonist, Sadie's character develops to reveal a more complex and vulnerable side. She is sharp-tongued, opinionated and initially appears to be a classic high school mean girl, but as the series unfolds, we learn more about her insecurities and her personal struggles, adding some depth to her character. Despite her abrasive exterior, she undergoes significant character development and forms unexpected connections with others. This is kind of regressed though, in part two of the final season. Her attitude and her general abrasive nature was kind of funny in high school, but as everyone has grown and matured and she didn't, it just felt kind of sad and, I don't know, pathetic. I hate the fact that they kind of babied her instead of forcing her to deal with the concept consequences of her action but um she does apologize so i guess happy ending i don't know i'm sorry <laughs> for whatever jesus i kind of stopped caring for her when the extra bitchiness came again in season five i was like you know what been there done that next hey stop don't touch me there that sir is my no no square then there's lissa who's the classic dumb blonde she's introduced as the bubbly dim with a cheerleader and Sadie's best friend. Though she's often seen as a clueless side chick, she appears to be quite emotionally mature sometimes and often gives random but great advice. Lissa's character explores themes of morality and personal value as she faces challenges that force her to question her beliefs. She's deeply religious and often relates and sometimes misinterprets the teachings of Christianity to even the smallest things. She initially hates Jenna for being friends and then dating Jake. But after a retreat camp, they become good friends and she's just generally a sweetheart for the most part. She also has an on again, off again with Jake. And I think that's like her most frequent um, relationship on the show. Your mom had a life before your dad. That is code for huge JJ. Then there's Lacey Hamilton, which is Jenna's young, appearance-obsessed mother who had Jenna when she was a teenager. I don't know, she's kind of fun, but... Yeah, questionable at times. Her heart tends to be in the right place too. And she's just gorgeous. I, yeah, I think she's beautiful. I loved her and the dad together as well. 
they were just a hot couple. It's nice to see when two hot people get together, it just makes sense, you know? Not in my bed. No. <laughs> her and Jenna seem to be polar opposite at times, but she has displayed genuine love and concern for her throughout the series. Deep down, she's a sweetheart, and it's nice when she can act her age and act like a voice of reason and give great advice. But you can tell she's still young and hasn't fully grown up and caught up to where she's supposed to be. But that's when we first meet her. As the series progresses, we see her become more mature, be more responsible, and yeah, it's just nice to see her growth overall. Pregnant does suck, but breastfeeding makes you skinny. It's burning and not itching, you're fine. And lastly, we have Valerie Marks, who is the school's guidance counselor and known for her eccentric personality and unconventional and borderline inappropriate advice. She becomes sort of a mentor to Jenna as she navigates the challenges of high school. Valerie is theatrical, she's out there and also provides a lot of comic relief on the show. Despite her unconventional methods, she generally cares about the well-being of her students and her heart tends to be in the right place for the most part. Her and Lacey also develop a nice friendship. She's just one of those people who can assess things without filtering it um, to see what's appropriate. So that's why she's kind of fun as well, I guess. Being that girl was my new identity. But I won't let it define me. And now with the characters out of the way, let's get into a recap of the seasons and of course we are starting with season 1. So season 1, episode 1, the pilots, begins with Jenna losing her virginity to the popular Matty McKibben at summer camp. She realises that getting the boy of her dreams though is not all she thought it'd be, especially when he's too embarrassed to be seen with her afterwards. You are the j -town. So he wasn't a poet. But nobody can know that I like you. Jenna also gets a confrontation letter, which is basically a very mean letter, just basically telling her how she's failing at being herself and ways that she could improve and do better. Cold, right? And has an accident in the bathroom, which everyone misconstrued for a suicide attempt. It was a misunderstanding of epic proportions. This incident leads to her getting a lot of attention at school, and she realizes that she can capitalize this and rise her popularity status at school to kind of get Matty's affection. And I've just got to say, what a first episode, what a start to a series. Like, well done. Like, I feel like they did what you needed to do. I said it before and I'll say it again. In next episode, though Jenna's cat is being removed, she falls off the table and dislocates her shoulder, which means that she has to wear a sling. Half my life. And while in PE class, getting changed, Sadie and Alyssa take a nude picture of her and send it to the entire school, mainly because Sadie hates her and is a bitch and is just jealous of her and Matty, and because Alyssa is jealous um, of her bottling friendship with Jake. At school, Jenna hears Matty be saying something mean about her photo and vents online about how she needs a hero. Matty sees this and goes to school and takes down all the photos of her and goes to her house to apologise saying that you only said that to take attention off it but i don't know if i believe that you tell me it looks like the face of a guy with good nice intentions yeah i didn't think so for sure for being my hero i was trying you ate that <laughs> anyways the pair make up and they kiss and they start um hooking up in private Though this is fun for Jenna, she wants more. She tries to pull herself out there by asking about, by asking if they can have plans outside um, of just having sex. And he invites her to a party with the in crowd at Lisa's house. She though thinks that this is him wanting to be public with the relationship and is disappointed when for the most part he ignores her and actually kisses another girl at the party. When Jenna realizes that the relationship is only ever going to be casual, she starts to put more effort to get to know Jay. And Tamara also invited her to the party, uses this as an opportunity to rise up in the social ranks. In the next episode, um, everyone who was in the hot tub at Liz's party basically has pink eye, including Tamara. This is also the episode where Ming finds out about Jenna and Matty's secret relationship and feels a bit hurt that Jenna didn't tell her about it prior. And thanks for keeping me in the loop. I'm not. At the homecoming bonfire, Jenna wants to DTR. What are you talking about? DTR, define the relationship. Um, with Matty, as this is an event known for students hooking up. <laughs> and you're, you're funny. Looking. <laughs> now you're beautiful. In the dark behind a dumpster. Jenna and Matty make out when, and she asks him if they're together, or he basically tells her that he's not ready for a relationship. And though she's not okay with it, she pretends to be because she doesn't want to lose him. I'm just not sure I'm ready to be in a relationship. I wasn't cool with it. I'm cool with it.
In the next episode, Jenna is obsessing about this new girl that she sees hanging around Matty and is jealous of her, feeling insecure and just not as good as... She also ends up in detention when she confronts a strange stalker who she feels like is advertising her um, attempted suicide because it wasn't actually an attempted suicide. At detention, she gets to meet this um, cool girl that Matty's hanging out with, who they call Jenna Plus, who she thinks is Matty's new girlfriend. But it's revealed that she's just um, Matty's older brother's girlfriend instead. Jake, who also ended up in, the, in detention, thinks that he's talking about her when he, Jenna confesses her relationship issues to him. At the end of the day, he kisses her, which takes Jenna um, by surprise because he felt like it came out of nowhere, which on her part he did. It did. In the next episode, Jenna is forced to mingle with Mingo girls um to help get her mom into an elite society of pv moms which are basically like stay at home rich wives within the community being a knickknacker means that i won't just be that girl who got knocked up in high school at one of the events she finds that jake and matty are working there and jake acts weird and after the kiss he confides in matty about the kiss and matty starts to get a little bit jealous also um one of the events is being held at Sadie's house what are you doing I'm gonna pee on her bed. And Jenna and Tamara sneak into Sadie's in, sneak into Sadie's room and steal her food diary slash journal. And Jenna uses it to blackmail Sadie into accepting her mom into the club and trying to be a bit nicer to her. You're welcome. However, when Jenna's mom overhears the other mom talking shit about her and her daughter, she realizes that maybe this club isn't for them. She will follow in her mother's footsteps and get pregnant at 17. At the end of the episode, um, Jake asks Gemma, Jenna if they can talk and Matty does the same because he's feeling jealous. But Jenna decides to ignore Matty and um, talk to Jake. Matty had all the power in our relationship because I let him. But this is like one of the first instances of her standing up for herself and deciding that she deserves better. And it's like, finally, but at the same time, we've all been there so we can cut off some slack. Next episode is centered around um, an event that I think is popular within the school, which is a mock DUI event to discourage students from drinking and driving. And Jenna is cast as the lead role. Playing Dead Stacy was bigger than being homecoming queen. But I was trying to bury my suicide stigma. But she doesn't want the attention because she's feel like she's had enough attention for her lifetime. Jake is also the male lead and during this period, his feelings begin to deepen for Jenna. This was coming from a woman who had simply referred to me as Lil Bitch since the day I was born. In the next episode, the adventures of Auntie Jay and Lil Bitch. <laughs> and we meet Jenna's mom's best friend. It's just before Jenna's um, 16th birthday, so they decided to throw a wild party um, Jenna because she wants to impress Matty and the mom and Ali because they want to party with teenagers I guess um, we don't really see the party but it's a blur it's a drunken blur and the next day and the next day a hungover Jenna tries to put together what happened um, over the course of the night basically she insulted and hurt Matty's feelings even though she was just being honest oh, that's not cool hey, it's true you never want to be seen with me because you think you're better than me she let Jake down nicely, I think. No, you gave me a lecture. Good God, I'm sorry. No, no, don't be. Look, you were right. I never should have kissed you after detention. It was a crappy thing to do, considering I have a girlfriend. And she kissed Ricky Schwartz, which is... Who is this weird guy that Tamara's had a crush on since episode one? This is why Tamara isn't talking to her. And when she goes to apologize, Tamara tells Jenna that she's so glad she wrote the confrontation letter. On Jenna's 16th birthday, Valerie surprises her with a birthday wrap in school ca cafeteria embarrassing her and the rest of the day doesn't go well either. It's basically just shit. A period comes, Sadie bullies her and ends up pouring drink a drink all over her. The only nice thing that happens to her is Matty basically dropping her home and they decide to put everything behind them and just be friends. But not too long after, Matty knocks on her door and reveals that he wants to be more than friends. And the episode ends with them again making out and I, I think dating. Jenna? Next episode begins with a fight between Jake and Lissa as Jake has confessed to Lissa that he, ki he kissed Jenna. What the hell is a sex touch? Ming, that's your handwriting. 
also jenna is trying to reconnect with tamara um and ask ming for help as she misses her best friend they talk things up we're not really talking about anything and we forgive each other and um tamara confesses that she did not write the letter but just wanted to hurt her instead she then shares a theory that she thinks matty wrote the letter which causes jenna to rethink her relationship with him especially as matty's asked her on, a, on the official first date and she thought this was this was them doing it properly and going public but it takes us to this really secluded private out of the way area nice and secluded hmm. guess we won't run into anyone either. and she's about to confront him about it it turns out the restaurant is owned by matty's family he's never really brought anyone here before and it's kind of a special place for him when he they get back to jenna's house tamara and ming are still there they end up having a mini games night playing a game of confessions but are won over by matty as i watched them fawn over him i started to wonder if i was as easy to fool as they were after the night tamara takes back her theory and says that she doesn't think that he wrote the letter he wrote the letter. I'll be right back. Why in the B plot, Lissa and Sadie team up to make Jake um completely ruin his friendship with Jenna, but he ends up apologizing to her instead. I think you're a really good person, Jenna, and you've been through enough. I didn't mean to drag you into my. He then breaks up with Lissa and realizes that she's her and Sadie are really terrible people, and he wants no parts whatsoever. We are done. I want nothing to do with you or Sadie. You two are evil. The second to last episode of the season is the lead up to the um, upcoming formal dance. And everyone's basically asking out their prom dates in big, cute, elaborate ways. Matty doesn't ask Jenna, but ask what color of dress she's wearing, which she knows technically wasn't asked, but it wasn't a big ask that she wanted. As Jenna looks around and sees like everyone else getting big, elaborate asks, she starts to feel a type of way. This is also worsened by the fact that Jake asks her to prom and she tells him that she can't go with him because she already has a date. She finds a way that Matty didn't tell Jake about it. In his defense, he did kind of try but pussied out because in general he is a pussy. But yeah, this is just speculation because I'm not sure exactly what happened because it's not completely clear. I think Matty was trying to surprise Jenna with an official ask so he tried to downplay it by asking them to skip formal. But this is the final straw for Jenna and she's like, you know what? Nothing. That pussy. Take care. I'ma just scoot on over and let you whack him. Get him again. Get him for me. This is this is not it. Like I deserve better than this. My standards should be higher than this. I'm not I'm done taking bare minimum. And I'm like, yes, girl. Just tell him we are strict all 2024. Come for energy or leave it in the playground. In another part of the story, um Sadie manages to steal Jenna's file with a letter in it. And Jenna is surprised that she's nominated for sophomore princess, but discovers that it was just a joke. And discovers that the back of the voting ticket is the confrontation letter, is reprinted and basically the whole thing has just been set to embarrass her which was actually kind of mean and sad but fortunately jake is there to comfort her and kind of be there for her in the final episode of season one jenna decides to go to the formal with jake but she convinces him to let tamara come as well as they're going as friends and big also tags along with her date quote unquote date going with a girl friend was the only way my parents would let me go the poc struggle is universal and very real love that <laughs> Matty decides that he will not give up on Jenna and go to the house, only to find that Jenna has already left for the formal. Unlike Maddie, Jake wasn't afraid to be a dork. And I was ready to dork out with him. Jake and Jenna have a really good time at the formal, and Jenna decides that maybe Jake is actually better for her. I always have a good time with you. It was exactly what I was thinking. Especially after they kiss. But just as they do, Matty shows up. Without either of them letting Jake know what happened, they talk about whether they can w work it out and get past this. But Jenna takes Jake's hand and stands on business, realizing that, you know what, things with Jake so far has been smooth sailing, it's nice, it's easy going, and yeah, she's gonna see where that goes. I didn't know if I should listen to my head or my heart. I'm so sorry. I think you're right. It's too late. After the dance, um, Jake and Jenna go home and they kiss. She asks him if he wants to come inside since the parents are not home, and he does, but she actually decides and asks if it's okay to wait, and he says of course. She talks about how holding his hand in public meant a lot to her, since he's, he's the first person other than a parent to hold her hand and claim her in public. It's just a really cute, wholesome moment, like... Does it freak you out? No. It just makes me realise what I've been missing. While making out, they set off the alarm and um, Jake has to go home. Jenna, looking for the alarm code, goes into one of the drawers in the kitchen and finds the notepad that had the same paper the letter was written on and realises that her own mother 
is the one who wrote the confrontation letter. Was chance. Uh-huh. Damn, I know, right? I need to ask you something. Have you slept with anyone else besides me? No, but what I have or haven't done it I love you. Season two. So over the winter break, Jake and Jenna have been dating, with Jake falling for her and ready to be in an exclusive relationship with her while she still has some doubts. At Matty's New Year party, he kind of apologizes and makes it clear that he wants another chance. I want another chance. I came with Jake. Yeah, but you can stay. With me. But she decides to stay with Jake and make things exclusive. This leads to some awkward tension between the three of them. Jenna was in love with this other guy. Is she still in love with him? I don't know. Why would you say that? Oh, I'm sorry. As Matty even goes as far as telling her that he loves her, when he heard from Jake that she was in love with the last guy she had sex with, which was, of course, Matty. During this conversation, though, she reiterates that she's happy with Jake. He never hit her or made her feel bad about herself. And since Matty is scared of losing Jake, too, he begs Jenna to tell him about them. I don't want to be anyone's secret anymore. And I don't want to keep secrets from Jake. He's not embarrassing me. And he never makes me feel bad about myself. Did I? I'm so sorry, Jenna. This is also the part where Ming is forced to interact with other Asian students at the school, also known as the Asian Mafia, and this part was a little bit funny. How do the Asians fit into this equation? It's no secret, they know everything about everything. Asians aren't magic, they don't have control over everything. Yes, yeah. they do. She's forced to ask a favor from them, and that's why we also meet Becca, one of my favorite characters. And should I ever need a favor? Anything. Ming Fei Yan Huang. One day. Jenna confronts her mother about the confrontation letter, and though she's still pissed, she promises not to tell the dad about it. But feeling the guilt, Lacey tells him anyways, which puts a big strain on their marriage, leading to Kevin moving out and breaking up with Lacey because he can't understand how she could have done something so cruel to her own daughter. No one gets to escape if I don't! After their parents' separation, Jenna starts to feel responsible and takes up Lisa's offer to join her church in a group camp trip in, in an effort to absorb herself. With Sadie tagging along, things go as well as you'd expect them to. I love Satan! I love Satan! And in the B plots, with the help of Valerie, we follow Lacey as she tries to get comfortable with being alone. Do you two want to share a table? No! I'm eating alone! In the Valentine episode, the school is divided between lovers and jealous haters. As Jenna prepares to spend her first Valentine's Day with an actual boyfriend, she finds herself still kind of jealous and obsessing over Matty's new situationship, I would say. Dating? No. He's about to hook, line, and sink her. Right. As he's treating her way better than he ever treated Jenna when they were together, which tells that clearly she's not completely over him. What? I love you. At the end of the episode, Jake tells her that she loves him, to which she replies, awesome, and Tia, it means this is awkward. Meanwhile, Sadie is now dating Ricky Schwartz, which is which came out of nowhere and obviously really hurts Tamara because he's just some weird band geek guy that Tamara has been obsessed with since the very first episode. And I'll be real, I, I don't get it. Oh, ladies, I'll be the best threesome of your life. Girl, I'm girl. Oh, Ricky. Get back and sing it for a vomit! This is also the first episode where Ming meets Fred Wu at the um, Black Hearts party. I'm Fred Wu, by the way. Ming. With things going well with Jake, she questions herself, trying to understand why it wasn't easy for her to say it back to Jake. She realizes that with Matty, she knew she loved him after they had sex, so she considered sleeping with Jake to help clarify her feelings. I think we should have sex. <laughs> she asks us the question, what comes first, sex or love? I used to jump into the sack thinking it would clarify how I felt. If the feelings weren't there before, then the sex was just that. Sex. With advice from Ali of all people, she decides that actually, you know what? It's probably better to wait for the feelings to actually come. Nobody falls in love overnight. It happened overnight. I'm in love. Jenna's aunt Ali returns halfway through the season as she's engaged and getting married to some rich guy called Dan the Man, who turns out to be Sadie's uncle. And since we're about to be family, I won't pull any punches. You're more of a six. You're pretty funny for a big girl. And you're refreshingly transparent for a gold digger. The next couple of episodes follow the preparation for the wedding, where Jenna meets Lacey's old high school boyfriend, who is also invited to the wedding. 
and worries that he would get in the way and permanently ruin any chances of their parents getting back together. She tries to intervene wherever she can and is successful because the parents end up working things out and getting back together. There's this kind of cute moment where she draws a parallel between her mom's love triangle and hers. Initially, she thought that her dad was the Jake, you know, this sweet, cute guy who's always there for her. And the high school boyfriend was the Matty who wasn't the best for her. Ben wasn't my mother's Matty. My dad was. Would my mom have ended up with Ben if it wasn't for me? But Ali clues her in and says that there's a reason that she calls the dad buzzkill. She realised that it was actually the other way around, with her dad even admitting that he wasn't always there for Lacey, especially when she got pregnant and he low-key doesn't deserve her. And we kind of feel a bit more for Lacey and give her a bit more sympathy. When we were younger, uh, I did and said a lot of awful things to her. You are my hero, Dad. And your mom is mine. I just had a thought, and Loki, I would actually love to see like a prequel um series centered around um Jenna's parents, seeing like what they were like in high school when she got pregnant and stuff, because the backstory between them sounds pretty interesting. Now leave. It's what you do best. Trying to stand up for Tamara as Sadie is rubbing her relationship with Ricky in Tamara's face, Jake confronts her. I'm the fool? Um, sadly, that would be you. Sadie tells Jake about Jenna's previous relationship with Matty and he breaks up with her without reason, just as she realises that she loves him, which she told him in a voicemail moments prior. I love you, Jake Rosati. Upon hearing the voicemail, he realises that maybe he made a mistake, but on his way to apologise to Jenna and make up, he sees her and Matty kissing, who heard about the breakup and was there to comfort her, even though he should have checked on his best friend as well first, but you know. I owe you an apology, I wasn't really familiar with your game. And the next day, Jenna tries to explain to him that she didn't cheat on him and they were technically not together when they kissed, and that Jake and Jenna had had a thing way before her and Jake even started, but Jake is just not trying to hear it. Jenna slept with Maddie, but she only screwed Jake. Over. She makes her blog public to prove this to him but this just leads to everyone finding out about Lacey and the confrontation letter and she gets a lot of hate even losing Valerie as a friend. Do you know who always lifted me up? Your mother. That's right. Hell dog. I really expected we were on the road to being besties. I don't think I can even be your friend. Meng is also starting to notice some weird stuff happening but she doesn't know why. But it's because she's basically dating Fred Wu, who is Becca's ex-boyfriend. What's his name again? Fred Wu? Fred who? Wu? Oh, Fred Wu! <laughs> I don't know him. Side note, episode 10 is called Pick Me, Choose Me, Love Me. And I think it's hilarious and a cute nod to one of my other favourites, Grey's Anatomy. So pick me. Choose me. Love me. Stand up! Stand up! Or maybe in secret? I don't want you to feel like a slut. That isn't funny. The two boys get into a public fight, but they eventually make up and ask Jenna to choose between them. After some deliberation, Jenna chooses Matty over Jake, and the two begin the relationship with a fresh start. Although Jenna wonders if she made the right decision by choosing to stay with Matty instead of going on a summer trip to Europe. I finally got what I really wanted. But I wasn't sure it was what I needed. And it's just like, girl, can't you just be happy and content? But also, Loki, she is so me coded. Like, I get it. In the season finale is the end of the year party, and Jake and Tamara kiss and become a couple as they are both going on a summer um, trip to Europe together. Becca's behind it, and she's not going to stop until she destroys me. She'll never let us be together. Fred Wu has to move schools because he's afraid of Becca and what she might do to them. And Sadie is devastated to find out that Ricky is cheating on her again, but this time with another guy called Clark, who she outed as gay some time before. Ricky! Junior year was like the Thursday night of high school and the beginning of the end. Season three is Jenna's most exciting year yet. When school starts back up, Jenna is jealous to find out that Tamara has a new look and is a bit more independent than she used to be and has become much closer with Jake and Valerie, feeling replaced and left out. In the first episode, Jenna also has a pregnancy scare and it's revealed that Ricky Schwartz is dead. They really came out swinging this season and I was seated. Hi, this is gonna be good. Hated Ricky Schwartz. I prayed for him to die and I thought about it every day. I feel guilty. 
That I don't feel guilty, and that's all I have to say. I hated Ricky Schwartz, too! Is a scum-sucking psycho, and he made my life miserable for three years. Ricky and I have been hooking up since the sixth grade. I hated him! I hated him! I hated him! I hated him! The school mourns Ricky's death and holds a vigil slash kegger party to express their feelings. These are his ashes. He's charred, top to bottom. Feel free to snort a little of him. It was epic. And Sadie and Tamara reluctantly, reluctantly bond over their anger at Ricky. Jenna confides her pregnancy scare in Jake instead of Matty, which hurts him, as he finds himself jealous of Jake and Jenna's friendship. He acts out by being distant at first, but later tells her that they need to talk, which she, ad which she tries her best to avoid because she's scared he's going to break up with her. She gets Tamara to organize a BFGF BFF, the boyfriend, girlfriend, best friends forever double date. I have been dreaming about this since I was six. To avoid um, having any alone time with Matty. They eventually though have a heart to heart where Jenna talks about her insecurities in the relationship because he was embarrassed of her at first and she's scared that he's gonna run at the slightest problem. What thing? A friendship? I guess, yeah. Hey, why can't we have that? Why can't I, I be that for you? Well, he reassures her that he's here and he cares about her and they decide to try and build a friendship as well why would you think that because you were embarrassed of me i was never embarrassed of you uh-oh c-a-p not to be nitpicky or anything but just pay attention to how he says he was never embarrassed of her okay my dad went through all five stages of grief for the loss of his only daughter's virginity denial anger bargaining depression acceptance when Jenna's parents find out that her and Matty are sexually active, they insist on telling Matty's parents and meeting. They have the McKibbins over for dinner and the two families argue over their parenting style, which turns into a bigger argument, even causing Matty to move out of the house, temporarily moving in with Jenna. Mean oh, here's a nice one. I'm afraid I masturbate too much. You do. Don't be so obvious. During this time though, Jenna takes a creative writing class where she meets an attractive, charming classmate called Colin. And over the summer, Ming has finally learned Chinese in an attempt to protect herself and take down Becca for ruining her relationship with Fred in the last season. During the Halloween episode, Jenna feels like she's not good enough for Matty after a hot or not list is published at school and she's clearly not and Matty is hot. But when they attend a party hosted at Angelique's house, who is Colin's girlfriend, she realises that she's not the problem but that she's just been hanging around with the wrong type of people. My suicide story, which made me a freak in my high school, apparently made me a hero in there. I fit in even without a costume. Meanwhile, over with Jakara, which is Tamara and Jake's um, couple name, Tamara tells Jenna that she's almost ready to have sex with Jake, but she's just waiting for him to say I love you. Skip to the present, Tamara is really excited when she's officially a cheerleader and she doesn't care about waiting anymore and she's ready for Jake. Jake then plans something special, but unfortunately, it's the exact same thing he planned for Jenna. His mom's decorated van, which obsessed Tamara and she runs away. Jake goes to the house to find out what happened and she explains that the only thing that was different in the setup was the air freshener and she feels like she's always second best. Jake reassures her that that isn't the case and that that was just his ideal way to lose his virginity. I had this whole fantasy of my first time. I just thought it'd be so cool. Really? A minivan? They end up saying I love you and doing it in the moment in her room which turns out to be a bit anticlimactic. It turns out they have to work on their sexual compatibility. I'm looking forward to figuring out this whole sex thing with you. When she updates Jenna about what happened, she says the I love you felt much better than the sex, but they're excited to figure things out together, which was honestly so cute. I'm not Asian. I'm white. And you know how a white bitch deals with an Asian bitch? Also back with Ming, after a power struggle with Becca, Ming wins and becomes the head of the Asian Mafia. He has a girlfriend. And you... A boyfriend. When Jenna's creative writing teacher instructs her to read a personal piece at an open mic, she and Colin grow closer as she realizes that she might have some feelings for him when he keeps popping in her head while she tries to write. Feeling like they just make better sense together as they have more things in common. I had no right to be offended that he hadn't read my blog, but I was. This causes Jenna to grow bored of her relationship with Matty and she begins a fling with Colin. And it's such a shame it's happening now because we see Matty putting a lot of effort into the relationship and trying to make it work. Just timing. The affair starts and Matty and Jenna have a massive argument. Or actually I would say conversation about how the relationship is just not working right now and they have things they need to work on as they're quite different, have different interests and and relationship has been too focused on Jenna with her not giving Matty space to be himself or to feel seen in the relationship. 
So you had your accident the same day we slept together. How do you, you didn't even try to explain it to me. Instead, you obsessively stared at me from a distance for weeks. I ain't gonna lie, I'm getting cooked. <laughs> you didn't want to be seen with me. Because I was mortified. You said you were never embarrassed of me. I lied. You liar! Sometimes it feels like all I'm doing is making amends for how we started. I'm the one who made a point to focus on you, to make sure you felt secure and significant. I wonder if you ever asked how I'm doing with my parents. It was really hard for me, Jenna, and you never checked in. Just assumed. Exactly, you assumed. Tia. They start having a secretive affair, but this is revealed at Jenna's 17th birthday surprise party when she's caught kissing him. I'm not even gonna lie to you guys, just even re-watching this, I was on the edge of my seat. Oh, look at Matty's eyes. Damn. Shit hits the fan. Get it. What's the point? You won't, I will. Oh. And you broke my BFGF BFF. Though Matty is willing to forgive Jenna, she breaks up with him for Colin and becomes increasingly isolated from her friends and her family as she spends more time with him and he encourages her to embrace her dark side. She smokes pot. Don't even have a life. The only job you've had for 17 years is being a mom and you suck at it. She skips classes and just starts walking a darker path, darker makeup and a new attitude, even writing a mean essay about Valerie that gets her fired. Tell me why you won't print it. Because it's cruel. Eventually though Jenna and Colin split when um, they flip his character completely out of nowhere, like a complete 180. That still doesn't make sense to me, but I get it for drama, I guess. Like, how does he go from this nice guy that's kind of there for her, cares about her reading, wants to hear her talk and whine, to a guy who always abandons her because she doesn't want to f*** him? Maybe I should take you home so you can deal with this. Unless he's always been that guy before, but they should have dropped it more or they should have showed it a bit more in my opinion. But thinking about it, maybe we just saw things the way Jenna saw things. We saw him as the guy we wanted to see him as instead of the guy he really was because the clues were there. You're classic. Like... Jane Austen. And you could just argue that Jenna is just a drama junkie. Symptoms of being a teenage girl. You know, she just always has to find a problem, always has to analyze something, always feeling on edge when something isn't right. You know, you can see from all sides, I guess. And you know what? We've all been there. We can't judge her too harshly. You could just argue that Jenna is just simply an insecure narcissist who who is attracted to anyone who validates her. Matty validated her physical appearance. Jake validated her in a sense of seeing her as more than a sexual object and Colin validates her writing and creativity. This is what studying English does to your brain. You just you can't pick a side and you just have to balance out both arguments. <laughs> or maybe my um L vans are just kicked in because my brain is on a roll. There's also this funny episode where to get through to Jenna, Valerie and her friends put on like an after school special show about the dangers of drugs and bad behavior. I guess it's time for me to start living. For now. I know you fucking lying, bitch. <laughs> I ruined friendships because of you. Alienated my parents. Those were all your decisions. That's all on you, Jenna. Look, I'm pretty sure I was clear about not wanting a girlfriend right now. If you were clear, then I'm deaf. You ate that. <laughs> If you brought this up to me at any point in the relationship... So now it's a relationship? A relationship that was never exclusive. Are you serious right now, bro? It turns out that he's not that caring and sweet and um, he's still dating um, Angelique. But she doesn't want an open relationship, so she kind of taps out of that. After she's suspended, she realizes her mistakes and asks for her friend's forgiveness. But her actions are not forgotten so easily, so she has to put in... So she has to put in a bit of work to earn their forgiveness. Ming's reign of power in the Asian Mafia eventually comes to an end when she faces a coup d'etat. A coup d'etat? She faces a coup. As head of the Asian Mafia! That's exactly what I'm talking about. We never say those words out loud. We're supposed to be hiding in the shadows. And former leader, Becca returns. She negotiates with Becca that she can keep her position as a leader of the Asian Mafia as long as she leaves her and her boyfriend Fred Wu alone. We don't really see Ming after this season and like I said earlier, it's low-key a shame because I really like the character and the actress. Back over with Jakara, after they said I love you, things were going sweet up until it was time for Jake to run, it was time for Jake to rerun for student class president. Tamara gets frustrated at him for not taking it seriously and putting any effort into, com into his campaign. I'm sorry that I want us to work on our relationship. Us? 
I do all the work. So she runs against him to prove a point. It ends up getting really heated with them and she ends up winning. And this really annoys Jake because it bubbles onto the relationship in the fact that she's trying to make him change and just being controlled and thinks she knows best. Basically, it ends up with she winning and he breaks up with her. This doesn't last that long though and they end up getting back together a few episodes later. Everyone kind of friends again in the one hour season finale. Jenna is upset when Matty asks Bailey, a new girl, to prom instead of her. She finds solace though in a self-discovery novel that is written by none other than Mr. Hart, who is her creative writer teacher. In a moment of selflessness, Jenna helps Bailey and Matt get together and go to prom together, despite her still wanting Matty. And Sadie finds herself falling in love with Austin, a guy that she met at Angelique's um, her Halloween party time ago. And what assumption was that? The assumption that you love me and you're afraid to say Not it. Not true. That wasn't a question. Because then you wouldn't know that I love you back. At the end of the episode, after dealing with some writer's block, Jenna is able to write a final creative writing essay, giving props to all her friends. They all go to the prom together, have a good time, and Jenna is finally content to being alone without a man. I can finally be that girl who doesn't need a boy to be happy because I'll know how to dance all on my own. Oh, she got it. Jenna, now in her final year, is still learning from her mistakes from the previous year. She attempts to be more involved in school, improve her academics, and prepare for uni while trying to rekindle her relationship slash friendship with Matty. There's a new girl in school called Eva, and it's revealed that during the summer, Ming broke up with Fred and moved away to Vermont. Sad face. Also, my little brother's here. Come and meet him. Come on. Lissa has a new adopted brother who turns out to be Koji, who I did not recognize because this was before the glow up. We think of him as just two months because that's when he met us. His accident is borderline ridiculous at times, but I would say again, very, very camp. I'm very much looking forward to a year in American high school. I know you fucking lying, bitch! <laughs> Her and her mother both have a crush on him, but him and Lissa end up getting together as a ski trip and they have a private relationship until they are caught and forced to break up. You know, you're not really my sister, right? Biologically or legally. Jake and Tamara's relationship also turns rocky as Tamara is the new class president and is, and is trying to focus on that while Jake has changed his image during summer and, f and is now focused on making music. There's this really, really, really cringe and unserious sex scene that I just have to include because it's hilarious. But for the most part, the situation isn't helped by the fact that Jake doesn't really get her where she needs to go, if you know what I mean. Tomorrow never comes, and I keep waiting. They eventually break up though, I think he initiated, initiated the breakup, which Tamara doesn't take well, to no one's surprise, and she even ends up catfishing him to keep tabs on him after the breakup, and he ends up falling in love with the catfish. But also after Sadie's family's life goes to shit with her dad losing all their money and her mom abandoning her to take care of herself from the last season, she now lives with her adoptive parents, Ali, while working nights at a food truck. You would think this would humble her and make her nicer, which it does a little bit, but not enough. There she meets her new love interest, Sergio, who she gets with after things and Austin um, kind of fizzle out. <laughs> Maddie and I kissed, okay? And it meant nothing. You're a liar and I need to break up with you. What? Matty also gets a job and continues to be friends with Jenna. They end up having sex one night, but his evasion afterwards leads Jenna to think that he's still embarrassed to be with her, when he is actually struggling with the fact that he's adopted and no one told him. He quits his job in rebellion and just acts out in general, and this leads to him becoming friends with benefits with Jenna. It is about me, it is all about me. I'm adopted, and it's f She eventually ends it though, Deciding that she doesn't want to do this and um, becomes romantically involved with Luke, a college freshman who she had met when she was visiting um, some university that she wants to go to. Her and Luke getting together causes some friction between her and Matty, and to compensate, she helps him and Ava get together. However, Jenna realizes she actually hasn't let Matty go. Ah, oh, shit. Here we go again. Which puts her strain on her relationship with Luke. Matty and Jenna argue whenever they see each other and this is not helped by Ava actively causing problems between them. It turns out that Ava is the villain of this half of the season. But I know Manny McKibben and he would never f*** you in my bed. But hey, nice try. The mid-season finale um, is set in that annual senior ski trip with Luke and Jenna breaking up as he's tired of the love triangle. I'm a friend of Eva's, Eva Mansfield. I'm Eva Mansfield. 
and Ava being caught in her lies. As Sadie discovers that her real name is Amber and she has actually been homeschooled since she was kicked out of her school when she was nine for stabbing a classmate with a pencil. When Sadie goes to her house, which is not even the, in the right district for their high school, she finds that it's decorated with a creepy stalker bulletin board of Jenna and uh, Matty and all their friends. And Sadie teams up with Jenna to expose her. But just as they do, she claims to be pregnant and Matty refuses to leave her. Also, Tamara and Jake end up putting everything behind them and try being friends again. Part 2 of Season 4 begins with Jenna deciding to spend time focusing on her finals and herself instead of trying to deal with everyone else's problem. Matty starts to have suspicions about Ava when she continues to antagonise Jenna and is so focused on them getting married. It must suck that you can't keep a man. <coughs> Johnny! That really hurt! To no one's surprise, it's revealed that her pregnancy was a lie. As Matty found out that she stole a pair of his mother's earrings um, as payment to the actual pregnant student called Gloria in exchange for using her pregnancy test. No. You lied about everything. You're not pregnant. You're, you're not anything. You now have 23 hours and 59 minutes. <laughs> Matty threatens her and she leaves and this person enter the whole Ava thing and her arc. Also, um, Jenna tries to make up with Luke but it turns out that he's already moved on and at this point he just wants to focus on school. On New Year's, Jenna wants to celebrate doing something small and low-key with Matty, now that Ava's behind them, but things don't go according to plan when he turns their plan into a group, group activity. Morning, people! Who's ready to get this New Year's jam And crashes Sadie slash Ali's house party. While they are there, Jenna and Marty make a pact not to hook up with anyone, but Jenna finds a new guy to kiss at midnight. It turns out that this guy is actually a sophomore and she's kind of embarrassed about it. She ends up basically doing the same thing to him that Matty did to her in season one. Also at the party, Matty's also at the party. I'm such an idiot to think that you could actually be into me. I mean, you're... Also at the party, Matty's able to finally have a heart-to-heart -heart with his mother and they're able to reconcile. And Jake hooks up with the older woman and Lissa finds out that her dad isn't 100% straight. You mean he made you lick his tummy? In the next episode, college acceptances are coming in and it seems like everyone's been accepted except Jenna. Jenna was aiming to get into Lockhart University, but she didn't get in while her mother did, which causes some friction in their relationship. Jenna eventually gets into Wyckoff College, I think, and that was pretty well. That goes pretty well for her, but we'll talk about that more in the next season. On Matty's 18th birthday, Jenna competes with his new girlfriend Gabby, only to realise that she's genuinely nice and means no harm, and they end up kind of forging a real friendship. I had been wrong to think she had any agenda other than kindness. In need of a drinking partner, Matty shows up to Jenna's house and they have a heart to heart. Jenna confesses that she feels the only reason they even dated was because she was easy. This stems from a comment that he made an episode prior. No, she's a virgin. Some things are just worth waiting for. You know what I mean? Let me at him! Let me at him! He doesn't dispute this though, but kind of reaffirms her um, and telling her that she's important to him and that the real reason he was there at her house was because he didn't want to be alone when he opened the letter that he got um, to find out who his real birth parents were, showing Jenna how much she means to him. After Matty's disappointment of discovering his birth mother doesn't want to be found, Jenna comforts him and the two end up kissing. But Jenna stops it, telling him that she doesn't want to be that person anymore and he needs to be loyal to Gabby. But Matty says, It's you and me. It's uh, kind of different. I go beyond the, um, the rules of high school. But she stays strong, trying to be better, as Gabby is nice and they kind of have a friendship. During spring break, towards the end of um, season four, the group go to Mexico and we see the return of Lissa, who is now bad Lissa, who doesn't believe in Jesus anymore. I was in prison. Mommy kept me in the house ever since I was suspended. I don't care about Jesus anymore if he doesn't want me to be with Tyler. Mommy can't make me. Mommy can't make me. After everything that's happened with her parents and Tyler, her friends help her dad escape from gay rehab and he's able to help reconnect her with her religion as he found acceptance through it. She talks about how having faith in nothing is kind of scary. I feel even more devoted to God now that I've accepted myself and know that he accepts me. Well, that God sounds really cool. Like, a God I could hang with. There is a God there that's accepting um, of the dad as he is, because that's how he made him. And I think that's, that little bit there is kind of cute. Also, Tyler turns up at Mexico, and they attempt to continue where they left off. Should we f like animals? Oh my God. I thought this was a classy part. As they had a secret affair or a secret relationship, they both feel like the chemistry is gone as the relationship isn't forbidden anymore. While in Mexico, Jenna is able to locate Matty's dad and they plan to meet up with him 
but Gabby shows up and she, and she goes with Matty instead. The meeting between them is a little bit awkward as he turns out to be completely wrong about him and Matty generally doesn't feel a connection between them. But in a way, he helps him realize that Jenna might be his soulmate. Girl would do that. Not every girl would care that much. What you got here, soulmate. Gabby feeling disconnected from Matty as he doesn't want to talk to her, open up um, to her about how he's feeling. And with Jake feeling sad about being rejected from his first choice of university, they end up sleeping together. Sadie and Sergio end up getting in arguments as Sadie is being extra bitchy, but it's just because she's scared of being in a long distance relationship. I don't want to miss you if I go. Too bad. By the end of the episode, they're able to talk things out and they make up. You think you're going to see him again? Oh, hells to the yes. We're engaged. Also, while in Mexico, Tamara gets engaged to a 19-year-old guy called Adam. Adam is in military training and she accepts his proposal thinking that he's going to serve somewhere far away. But in reality, he's going to be in California, which was not part of her plan at all. Also in Mexico, Lacey discovers that she's pregnant and considers not going to college. But Jenna is there to encourage her and um, kind of reaffirm her that she can do it. She puts her mind to it and she shouldn't just give up on her dream of going to school. Which was kind of cute. At the same bar that um, Tamara met Adam, Jake also meets a guy, um, I think it's Adam's friend, and they kind of start a little fling. This is her attempt to let go of Matty as he's been kind of distant most of the trip. Obviously, Gabby's there, so she just needs to back off and let the couple be together. Upon realizing that he wants to talk to Jenna and he's not exactly been, you know, the best to her on the trip, he goes to the beach to get away and clear his head, but he sees Jenna there with her new date in the distance. Jake shows up at the beach, initially wants to confess um, about him and Gabby, but chickens out when Matty confides in him that he's always been there for him and he's always been an honest good friend. The episode ends with Matty staring at Jenna in the distance with a new date, wondering whether he's lost his chance at true love with Jenna. After Jenna's mom basically told him to leave her alone and let her be happy, that he's broken her heart enough times. Let her go. You had your chance. Jenna, are you running through the hallway naked? Oh, that reminds me, I need a haircut. Season 5, also split into two parts, is the final season of the show. The first part of season 5 focuses on the last couple of months before high school graduation. Matty and Gabby are still dating, though he's unaware that Gabby had sex with Jake. Jenna is still kind of seeing Brian, um, the marine she met in Mexico, and Tamara is still engaged to Adam, even though she plans to break things up with him. When Adam and Brian come to visit, Jenna realizes that the spark between them from Mexico is gone and they break up, and Tamara, however, doesn't break up with Adam as she gets swept up in the idea of um, getting married. You had save the dates, Bernard? Get your hands off my STDs. Also, Jenna finds out that Jake and Gabby had sex but doesn't tell Matty. Oh, and by the way, I Jake. When Matty eventually finds out though, he breaks up with Gabby and ends his friendship with Jake. Gabby and Jake decide to start dating since they genuinely like each other. At a beach party organized by Jenna, Matty gets really drunk and publicly says some mean-spirited things to Jake and about their friendship. You can't hurt me because you are Jake and I'm Matty f***ing McKibben. This causes the whole school to turn their back on Matty and he becomes unpopular for the first time in like I think his entire high school career. Matty begins hanging out with Kyle, another outcast at school. Jenna, however, becomes very popular thanks to the fact that she caused the whole school to get a day off by accidentally causing a blackout. That's right! Blackout party at the beach, bitches! <laughs> she begins hanging out with um, the in crowd and the Julie, so like one of the popular girls in school again, but quickly discovers that Everything about that in crowd is fake, so she goes back to her true friend. She goes back to her true friendships um, and a true friend, Tamara. Tamara is still caught up with the idea of getting married um, in, the, in the wedding planning and even goes as far as planning an engagement party. But at the party, Jenna accidentally reveals to Adam that Tamara is planning to break up the wedding and Adam dumps her. And she got carried away and agreed to marry him because she thought he'd be shipping off before she ever had to go through with it. After this, Tamara realizes that she actually does love Adam and tries to win him back. Though he's not trying to hear it, and yeah, it's in take her back. I love Maddie. Oh shit, here we go again. Jen also realizes that she's still in love with Matty again, and tries to tell him. But after realizing that they're going to school at the opposite side of the country, Matt is going to Berkeley and Jenna is going to Wyckoff College, she decides not to. Jenna is nominated for prom queen and decides to go to prom with Tamara since they both have no boyfriends and don't really want to go with other guys. Sadie gets dumped by Sergio, so Matty asks her to prom as friends. All I want to do is love you and you fight me every step of the way. I can't fight anymore. Also, Sadie's mother returns and makes it seem like she wants a relationship with her daughter. But it turns out she's just 
trying to present or look like a good mother so she can impress her new boyfriend and that breaks Sadie's heart again. Why couldn't you just accept me for who I was? Like all the other mothers. Try to be a better mother. And all I can do is try to forgive you. Throughout the series, we've seen the up and down unhealthy relationship between her and her mother. That her mother is just a terrible person who constantly shamed her for her appearance. And she's just just never been there for her. Is that you only came here to convince Ted you were a good mom so you could trick him into marrying you. He'll find out on his own eventually what a terrible person you are. It really makes you feel for Sadie because she never really had that love at home. And yeah, we sympathize with the character and it makes the character more three-dimensional. Jake goes solo since him and Gabby have broken up after he told her he wanted to take a gap year. And Lisa gets asked by Theo after Cole decides to go with his boyfriend and they go together. At prom, Adam surprises Tamara, which leaves Jenna alone, even though she's happy for Tamara though. Jenna decides just to go home um, and Matty and Sadie get drunk in a limo and Sadie tells him that if he does actually love Jenna, he needs to just tell her. I want to be all there when I tell Jenna I love her. Lacey tells Jenna to go back to the prom because it, it's her senior prom and she would just always regret not being there. And Jenna goes back to prom and sees Matty. They confess their love for each other and start dating again. I love you. I just do. It's not something I can decide to do or decide not to do. It's just, it's like breathing. You ate that. <laughs> At the prom, Sadie is caught with alcohol, which isn't hers by the way, um, which almost leads her not to be able to graduate with the rest of the class. Because they're Matty's, he owns up and he's told that he too can't walk with the rest of the class. So the class gets together to try and change the faculty's mind. Jenna, without her, there would be no us. Like her or hate her, Sadie's been a great friend and she's always had my back and I, I don't want to walk without her. They let Matty, but not Sadie, but Matty's adamant that he doesn't want to walk without her. Even if it means indulging in his sick fetish for tragic little slunts, I want him to be happy. So Jenna goes to Sadie to convince her to put up more of a fight and together they're able to sneak her in. You're welcome! And thankfully, all cute and montage-like, the class of 2015 are able to graduate together. The graduation ceremony though is surprisingly but not that surprisingly hijacked by Valerie and turned into an improv wedding with Jenna as her bridesmaid. She's getting married to a guy called Willie who she met all the way back in season 4 during the ski trip. It seems like everyone's going to enjoy their summer but Matty has to go to Berkeley the day after graduation. It had taken four long years but something Val said actually resonated. Him and Jenna think about breaking up but they decide to stay together and give it a go. This part of the season ends with Jenna deciding to help Matty move into his dorm um, at university and then planning to make their relationship work long distance. It's cute, it's nice, it's full of hope. Because deep down, we knew that love would conquer all. Of course, that's not quite what happened. I just want to say a real reason why I think this season wasn't that memorable and I don't have strong memories about it was because it felt kind of rushed. It didn't feel like a series finale. It felt more like a random in-between season. And I don't know, it just it was just such a shame. I get what they were going for, but it didn't quite hit the way it should have. I hate to say it, but I think it would have made more sense if the show was cancelled and they didn't get a chance to wrap things up. I'm sorry if I sound ridiculous, but that would have been better, I think. Like, in all honesty, yeah, I think the way they ended the first half of season 5 was a better finale than the actual finale we got. It could have just left it there. But yeah, let's go into season 5, part 2. So the second part of the season begins with a one year time jump as everyone comes back to Palos Hills for summer after their freshman year at college. And we see just how much everyone has changed. And yeah, after a great start, I was kind of here for it. Jenna is completely different. Not completely different. Jenna is a bit different. She stepped more into a pretentious, artsy, hippie, you need to then vibe with the nose piercing. Her and Matty aren't even friends anymore, they ain't talking. Sadie and Tamara are surprisingly now friends. Lissa and Jake are dating. And it just served as a, like, a nice reboot. The second episode of part two is where we find out what happened to everyone the previous year. So between Matty and Jenna, basically they broke up when he came to visit her one weekend at college. He wasn't exactly fitting in with her uni friends as they had a similar vibe to Colin and his girlfriend from season two. And when Matty doesn't really fit like he belongs, he tends to act out. But rewatching it again, he had some points. They were actually being rude and disrespectful to his face. I don't deserve either. But you seem like you do. Mm -hmm. yeah, what does that mean? They end up getting into arguments when he feels insulted by her friends. Pardon me for not being pretentious. I know that's right. 
and she learns that he quit football because he wasn't automatically the star player and didn't really want to try harder. After they resolve the argument the next day, he tells her that he wants to transfer to her uni, which causes another argument and their eventual breakup, as Jenna doesn't want him kind of invading on her new space and community that she's built here, and she felt like he was just running away. I feel like he, abrupt he abruptly dumped her and wanted her to fight for him, and she didn't. What are you I'm leaving. Goodbye, Jenna. Um, when Jenna comes back from school, after some ups and downs, a bit of hiccups of running into each other, Jenna and Matty find a way to be friends again until an article um, she wrote about the relationship was butchered in the edit and posted to the Idea Bin website. Dorothy is good for her raising her credibility within her workplace and on social media. This upsets Matty as um, it's written to make him look terrible basically. Out of some back and forth, she asks for the article to be taken down and begs Matty to read the real complete version and for forgiveness but he's really not trying to hear it. So she stands outside his door and reads it to him, putting the rest under the door so that um, he can see that what he read isn't what she wrote. They made it out to seem he was worse than she said, basically. Eventually though, he reads it and they're able to be friends again. Um, when he comes over to Jenna's house and helps her babysit her little sister for a bit. It's just back and forth, up and down with these lot. I don't even know where they are. They've been doing too much. My relationship with Maddie was strained in the present, and my relationship with Maddie was left in the past. But as he held Morgan, I got an image of what our future could have looked like. In present day, Maddie is now dating a fellow Berkeley student who doesn't take anything seriously. She's one of those girls who's one of the guys. She's fun for a while, but then he realizes that he needs to get serious and brings up with her not too long after. This is not how my breakups usually go. You're cool? Yeah, dude. It's not that deep. We also see that she has a bit of a drinking problem, so it was for the best, and she didn't even seem to be that bothered about the breakup. In regards to what sparked the friendship between Sadie and Tamara, they were both struggling to fit in um, at the universities in New York, and they basically just bonded over like seeing a familiar face in an overwhelmingly big sea of the unknown. A familiar face, and I took pity. Don't wet your pants over it. Which came out of nowhere, but I actually kind of liked, even though Tamara would just sit there and let Sadie talk shit about her best friend. But that's none of my business. That's suspicious. That's weird. And what happened between Jake and Lissa? Basically, Lissa dropped out of uni after her first semester because she was too stressed and just wasn't really enjoying uni. And decided that, you know what, she just wants to be a PV mom, which is basically a rich housewife. She gets a job as a living nanny for Jenna's new for Jenna's new baby sister Morgan. And Jake, who was deferring for a year, got fired from his then third job after getting caught smoking a joint outside a restaurant but with Lisa's help he's able to get a new job as a towel boy at the Palos Hill Country Club where he becomes manager not too long after and during this period they kind of are there for each other and, and grow closer. Back to present time Jenna has secured an internship at a writing center called the Idea Bin and finds out that her ex from season three I think Luke also works there and that when they were together he basically got her the internship. She struggles um at first, at Idea Bin, both creatively and socially, but eventually finds her groove and even secures the main writing prize um, of the internship as she realizes that writing about relationships and love is her strength and where she finds her voice. Her and Luke get back together after they spend a night working late and end up sleeping together. For the most part, things seem to be going well for them, even though he wants to keep the relationship a secret at work, with his reason being wanting her to be taken seriously, as he's technically her supervisor. This obviously brings back some negative feelings, especially um, with how things were with her and Matty in season one, so her reactions are kind of understandable. We're a secret, and it brought me back to a bad time in my life. Like I said, the relationship goes well for the most part, even with them moving in together at some point. When she explains the relationship in an article she writes for their website, they get into an argument as he liked the fact that the boss felt like she had a chance with him and he liked getting that special treatment. To make things up to her, he sends some of her writing to the university that she wanted to go to and helps her able to get to get a transfer. She struggles deciding on what to do and Matty pulls her aside to make sure that she's doing it for the right reasons and not for Luke. Similar to how he wanted to run away and move to her university earlier in the season. What I want is to tell you to choose me over him. But I, I'm not gonna do that. Because the one thing that I want more than that is for you to choose yourself. Which shows so much growth on his path and it's a cute, genuine moment between them. And I also love the fact that it was in a closet at camp, um, which is the same place they first hooked up in season one. 
they talk about how the future is unknown and they'll always be in each other's life one way or the other which is kind of sweet when you don't think about the fact that she's technically still with luke but they end up kissing but at this point we just have to accept that jenna as much as we want to love her or love to hate her she's just a cheater that's okay <laughs> i don't like the way they left luke and jenna kind of confusing and in space just to make more space for jenna and matty because at this point they've tried and tried and tried and it hasn't worked out so what ending is this because we don't get we don't know what's gonna happen with them whereas i generally feel like luke at this stage anyways is really good for her and they're working well it doesn't make sense at all to go back to matty at this point so i don't i mean i know they want to give us our otp ending and all but that's why it should have ended it in the first half of season five because this doesn't make sense. They've created so many shit now and so many new different moving parts that can be wrapped up in like, what, half a season? Poor. With her new friendship with Sadie, Tamara gets caught up living the high life, which leads to her getting a shit ton of credit card debt. But with Jenna's help, she gets um, Tamara a job at idea bin and everyone instantly falls in love with her which jenna is kind of jealous of she spent all the money she earned at idea bin at sadie's birthday but then she gets a reality check and realizes that she's in a lot more shit regarding her credit card debt than she realizes that sucks that's all you have to say and when sadie isn't really there for her and doesn't want to borrow her money their friendship kind of falls apart she has to get a job as a professional bridesmaid which, which fortunately helps and there she runs into her ex-fiance adam who is unfortunately engaged to someone else. They express some kind of care for each other and he encourages her to be honest to the rich guy that she's seeing. I always hoped we'd end up friends. You, know, you were way too important to me to just fade away. And if he doesn't like the real you, maybe he isn't worth it. She takes his advice and opens up to her rich boyfriend and the relationship gets stronger with him even offering to pay off her debt which she debates but eventually declines, wanting to be independent and, and learn to stand on her own two feet and not want to feel like a helpless loser. Which I get, but personally, I'm gonna take the help. The least crazy girl I've ever met. Also, Lissa and Jake break up when Jake loves his job a bit too much. And that isn't what Lissa had in mind for her future as she wants to marry a rich man. You shouldn't have to change who you are, but neither should I. They manage to stay friends though, but Lisa soon realizes that if she wants a rich man, she's gonna have to settle. With Ophelia's help, she becomes empowered and decides that maybe she can beat her own rich man by becoming an Atonicize instructor, which is basically a uh, fitness instructor. This takes off with Jake's help when she starts posting online and she gets, um, and it seems like this is gonna be a profitable career for her. Doing well in his job as a manager, Jake gets another promotion but realizes that maybe he's not totally content with the role and doesn't want to spend the next 20 years of his life working there. In his words, he needs to get the hell out of there. So by the season finale, he decides that I quit the country club. Really? No way. Palos Hills is great, but I gotta get the hell out of here. I was thinking New York. Also, Sadie returns to Palos Hill, pretending to be a change woman, but it soon comes crashing down when she finds out that Sergio has moved on while she was away. I have plans. With your mama? No with his girlfriend. Her and Sergio kind of get back together with him even admitting that he's in love with her. But as the summer comes to an end, with all their friends focused on figuring out their future and what path they want to pursue once summer's over, Sadie becomes resentful that her path isn't quite figured out yet and they just aren't putting up her shit anymore. Whoever shut up? And this is a bitch. Tamara's a jerk. Sergio's an asshole. Now Jenna. Do you ever notice how everyone else is the problem? You know what, Sadie? If you meet more than two assholes in a day, that ass is probably you. And it's like, Finally, about time. Um, with this, she quickly reverts to her former high school personality, just basically being an annoying, loud-mouthed bitch to everyone. And this leads to her being isolated for her, from her friends and Sergio. I would literally rather die than be friends with you. Ew, no, too pathetic. There's this kind of full circle moment where she gets she has an accident that is misconstrued as a suicide attempt, and she has to receive counselling from Val similar to Jenna in season one, which is kind of funny. Given the circumstances of your accident. I didn't try to kill myself. It got a bit of a chuckle for me. And towards the end though, she kind of apologizes for her behavior and they make up. So I guess happy ending. And you never held it against me if I got a little bitchy because you knew how much I loved you. The final episode is the final weekend of summer and the gang decide to spend their final week at Camp Puka, which is now closing down. It's a cute kind of open ending where nothing is kind of set in stone. It feels like a new beginning, which I think they were going for, but I don't know. It just felt, yeah, like I said, it felt more like a, a random in-between season, not like the end. Nothing is set in stone, everything is still up in the air. We don't know what's gonna happen to the characters, so 
take that as you will. But yeah, all in all, like I said earlier, this finale was not it for me. They would have been better off ending it at the first half of season five instead of this second half business because a lot of the stuff felt repetitive. It felt rushed. Like, I wasn't that invested in a lot of the shit that was happening in the second half. Like, we don't care. The season's almost over. So yeah, just unmemorable, rushed. And then the ending wasn't satisfying. I don't know about you guys, at least that was for me. So it's a shame that they started off strong but didn't end as strong. But that is the norm. That's what we expect from TV shows now. So it is what it is. All in all, like I said earlier, Awkward was a fun show that I really enjoyed, especially from season one to three. I could rewatch really those um, over and over again because it's just fun to watch. It's witty, it's smart, it's edgy. Characters are enjoyable and it's sometimes relatable, and it was just a good watch. I really enjoyed it, and I'm genuinely surprised that no one talks about the show. Like, maybe they do, and I'm just not part of these small pockets of the internet, but I feel like we should talk about this show more. It deserves its flowers. Let me know in the comments though if you did watch Awkward, if this video, if you didn't and this video would make you watch Awkward, I'm curious. If you did watch the show, let's talk in the comments, what did you like, what did you dislike, what plot lines, what storylines did you like. I want to hear all that good stuff. And yeah, this has been my recap of Awkward. I hope you guys enjoyed. As always, leave a comment, um, don't forget to like, subscribe and yeah, I will see you guys in the next one. Take care, bye!